Um, let me introduce uh, Professor Shastri <laughs> uh, before uh, she um, uh, starts speaking. Uh, so Professor Shastri is an astrophysicist of over four decades and investigates the physics of giant black holes that are found in the centers of distant gal galaxies using telescopes at multiple frequencies based on Earth as well as in space. She got her PhD from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and after postdoctoral research positions in the University of Texas at Austin, University of California at Berkeley and the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, she was a faculty of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bengaluru for 23 years. She has been a Fulbright Fellow at Stanford University and is currently Emeritus Scientist at the Raman Research Institute and Adjunct Professor at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research, Australia. She is extremely passionate about science outreach. She believes that the cultivation of scientific thinking is for everyone, uses astrophysics as a vehicle to engage lay audiences of all ages with these questions, and works for the people's science movement towards this goal. She's also deeply concerned about the inequities in the sciences and attempts to bring an intersectional lens to the endeavors to mitigate them. She is the founder and past chair of the Gender in Physics Working Group of the Indian Physics Association and a past member of the Working Group for Gender Equity of the Astronomical Society of India. She is vice chair of the Women in Physics Working Group of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics and vice chair of the Executive Committee for the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. In addition to her research publications and popular articles on ast astrophysics, her published work includes writings on gender in inequity as well as science and society. And uh, with that, I will now um, ask uh, Professor Shastri to please share her talk with us. Good morning and thank you very, very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, give a second talk uh, during my first visit to IIT Gu Guwahati, uh, your beautiful campus. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, to everyone for uh, participating in this. So I will start um, by asking the question, how do we de-gender uh, our science practice. By that I mean, how do we make a gender not a salient factor uh, in our science practice? Um, and I think uh, over the years, having thought about this question, uh, I uh, feel that there is a certain mindset uh, that will better position us uh, to address the question, which is, I think, encapsulated by this quote by uh, Lilla Watson uh, uh, from the Aboriginal Activist Group in Australia. And uh, she says, if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Uh, so I do think that when we think about uh, the marginalization of certain uh, groups of people because of some kind of group identity, uh, this is the mindset uh, which will take us forward. So why uh, is there a gender gap in science? Uh, I should say that I'm really happy that uh, we will have both a sort of outsider to science practice talk here after me, and we will have individual uh, individuals tell their stories, because I think that there are limitations to just looking at uh, data and seeing what we infer from the data, which is what scientists like me I want to do. But nevertheless, I will present some uh, uh, data just to uh, give a sense of uh, where we are on that front. So if we ask the question, uh, why is there a gender gap in science? Uh, and one of the uh, sort of hidden subtexts in a, a lot of people's minds is uh, this question, are women less competent in science? Uh, however, uh, there was a survey by uh, Neelam Kumar published as early as in 2001, where she surveyed four scientific institutions and compared uh, the scientific productivity of uh, men and women scientists. Uh, she found that there was no productivity deficit uh, among the women. 
there was uh, a survey of qualifications uh, by Subramanian published in 2014, where she found no qualification deficit among the women. There were more women rank holders among women scientists employed in scientific institutions, and there were fewer women of lower university rank. So uh, that is, shall we say, off the table. Uh, the, another idea which is often uh, uh, put forward is that, oh, we have to start when they are young. We have to start in high school. And uh, people claim that there is a lack of interest in science among girls. Now, uh, this is an idea that has been propounded uh, all over the world. And perhaps in some cultures, it is also true. Uh, but in India, uh, if we look at the data, uh, if we look at the prestigious Inspire fellowships, which are awarded to uh, 12 standard graduates in order to, to study science uh, in BSc and uh, Masters, uh, more than 50% of those scholarships are won by women uh, in all sciences, and 50% are won by women in physics. Uh, and uh, if we look at the statistics for the Indian Academy of Sciences summer uh, fellowships, uh, which are awarded to undergraduate and master's students, uh, more than 50% are won by women. So this certainly does not suggest that um, there is a lack of interest in science among girls. The same thing is true of women's enrollment in science. So, so which would mean that, you know, these kinds of initiatives, which sound very warm and fuzzy, uh, having science camps for girls and attracting girls to science and so on, uh, they're really barking up the wrong tree at least in India. I want to point out this very interesting study uh, which was published in Current Science in 2018 uh, by Malhotra and Joshi uh, where they tested percep certain perceptions about studying science among uh, students from four high schools in Dehradun. And so they asked the question, is it true that fewer girls and boys are interested in higher studies in science and maths? And more boys than girls said yes. So uh, boys I represent by red and uh, girls by blue. Uh, more girls than boys said no. And more boys than girls said don't know. Uh, similarly, they are science and maths is difficult and girls go for easier subjects. How true is this? And again, more boys than girls said yes. So certainly it seems that boys are socialized even by our education system or despite our education system to think that girls are incompetent in science. So if at all we have programs uh, to intervene in this uh, problem for younger people, uh, I think we need to have programs for all genders where the programs not only include uh, uh, things related to science and experiments and learning by doing and all of that, but also which try to dismantle uh, this perception uh, that uh, gender is somehow linked to either competence or interest in science. So everyone, regardless of their gender, needs to learn that all people uh, can do science. Now to go back to that study by Neelam Kumar, where she found that there was no productivity deficit among women scientists compared to men scientists. Despite this, she found that women were systematically lower in the hierarchy in the science institutions and the average age of women who were professors or equivalent was significantly higher than uh, those for men and she concluded that indeed there is discrimination within uh, the profession. So it is a flawed meritocracy. So then why is there a gender gap in science? The cause lies within and in our unscientific science practice, ironic as that sounds. And I would like to uh, also say that the gender gap, I think, is a symptom of barriers within science practice along other dimensions. So, for example, uh, caste or the hegemony of English language competence and so on. So, uh, what is the way forward? I think uh, uh, the uh, it's... Uh, uh, instructive to think about how interventions have been designed so far. So uh, there remain many uh, who do not feel welcome and included. And so the interventions largely uh, seem to rest on helping them, helping the marginalized, uh, 
uh, even when that helping is framed in a sort of equity uh, framework that uh, interventions need to be equitable, so the marginalized are given a higher ladder, so to speak, that is still missing uh, the obvious, which in this case uh, is the bent tree. So we really need to fix the bent tree rather than give the marginalized group a higher ladder, right? Uh, so we don't want this and we don't want this either because in the gender dimension this amounts to fixing the women and there is nothing wrong with the women. It is that certain groups of people uh, such as women are being pushed back rather than uh, you know they being uh, they needing uh, some sort of a push in order to come ahead. So we do need to look at the evidence and what we really need to be doing is to fix the tree, the bent tree. So unless the systemic problem is acknowledged, change will be too slow uh, and at a huge cost. But among Indian scientists, typically, while there is acknowledgement that there is gender disparity, there is not an acknowledgement that there is gender discrimination within. And furthermore, while we design interventions, we have to be mindful that all of us, regardless of our gender, are brought up to accept sexist thought and sexist action. And uh, so that, is, uh, be that becomes really important when uh, interventions are designed. So with all this in mind, uh, we propose to the Indian Physics Association, which is the National Professional Society of Physicists, to constitute a gender and physics working group. Uh, we did that on Women's Day 2016. Uh, they approved the launch of it in uh, 2017, a year later. And one of the highlights uh, of, this, of the activities of this working group uh, was a national conference called Pressing for Progress, which was organized in the University of Hyderabad. Uh, it was a first of its kind conference. Uh, it had physics, about 200 physicists and about 40 uh, practitioners from other disciplines, such as sociology, uh, education, uh, even theater practice, and so on, who all sat together and deliberated about the uh, problem of gender inequity in physics. And uh, we launched something called the Hyderabad Charter for Gender Equity in Physics uh, in this conference with a lot of inputs from the participants in the conference. So um, this charter has, of course, certain very, very obvious fundamental principles. Uh, uh, people of all genders have equal potential to excel in all aspects of physics practice. Utilizing the talents of all is essential for the physics enterprise to achieve its full potential. So we talked about physics because this was about uh, the problem in physics, it was an Indian Physics Association initiative, but it is, of course, uh, not necessarily restricted uh, to physics. Although I have to say that physics is one of the disciplines in which the gender gap is among the worst in academia. Uh, it has a bunch of guiding principles. I won't uh, go through all of them, but uh, I will highlight a few. And that is followed in the charter by a bunch of recommendations. So among the guiding principles, we say closing the quantitative gender gap at all levels of physics practice is a necessary step to achieve equality, but it's not sufficient. Uh, we say the practice of physics is a social activity and addressing its gender bias requires insight from the social sciences. So I think this has been one of the weaknesses of a lot of efforts towards gender uh, equity in the sciences in India, uh, that the practitioners of science have championed the cause. Uh, however, they have uh, sort of been oblivious to the enormous scholarship that is there in the social sciences on the question of inequity, and also uh, from the are uh, also been oblivious to the sort of strong insights from the feminist movement in India, which is also uh, at a fairly uh, advanced uh, level. We say that when a process of selection 
within uh, science practice reduces the gender fraction from that in the pool, it is a signature of a biased process. So the interventions and strategies must be such that they do not endorse societal patriarchy. I think this is really important. So for example, uh, rather than advocate for increase in maternity leave, uh, we should try and convert maternity leave into parental leave and not make it only for women. Uh, similarly, there is uh, often uh, this is advocated. Let's have flexible working hours for women. And I think it's important to not do that, but to instead have flexible work hours for all as part of an initiative of uh, work-life balance, or however you want to call it, for all. Uh, it's also, of course, important that institutions must assume immediate and ongoing responsibility to move towards uh, gender equality. The onus should not be uh, on groups who are the marginalized, whether it's women or on any other dimension, uh, because equality is everyone's work and more so uh, the work of institutional leadership. So we say in the charter, criteria for hiring should be formulated beforehand, meaning before initiating the process. And there should be no hidden norms uh, or hidden criteria that should be used. Even as we speak, we still have institutions in India, uh, including elite Indian institutions, which will disqualify a meritorious women candidates just because they have a spouse or a boyfriend uh, just be in the institution. So, uh, and this will never be stated in the advertisement. So in that sense, it is a hidden norm. Uh, however, transparency and accountability in governance is really, really uh, necessary in order for us to have uh, an equitable science practice. And so uh, that's why we highlight this, uh, because it's very common uh, still today. Uh, institutions, we say, should invest in diversity officers as observers on selection, hiring, and promotion committee. How much time do I have? Uh, so uh, it's very common nowadays, and there's even government regulation that committees should have women on them. Uh, the point is that that is a good thing to do because it's a right thing to do. But it is not necessarily uh, going to so solve the problem we have at hand. So it is important to have gender diversity on all committees, uh, but not necessarily to address the problem of inequity. Because as I said before, all of us, regardless of our gender, are brought up to accept sexist thought and sexist action. So just by having a woman, that doesn't mean that the process will be equitable. Uh, diversity officers, on the other hand, have expertise uh, in uh, diversity, so they should be there. There is another problem today uh, with uh, me meeting this regulation of there should be women on every committee, uh, especially in institutions, maybe not in institutions like IIT Guwahati, but in institutions where there are very, very few women. So. Uh, Already the women face discrimination at many, many levels uh, insidiously. On top of that, they are overburdened with needing to serve on a whole bunch of committees uh, because they are, there are so few of them. And so then it becomes a double burden. And of course, they don't get acknowledgement for that extra work that they have to put in. They are still expected to uh, meet the uh, requirements of uh, promotion and hiring and so on as usual. So that is why we recommend that diversity officers is the way forward. Um, so we uh, uh, suggest that these recommendations that are in the charter should be debated locally in each institution and fine-tuned or questioned or modified or whatever uh, for the classroom, for the department, for conferences, for editorial boards, and for outreach and exhibitions and so on. So some examples. So for example, does an institution uh, when it comes to felicitation of honored guests, uh, are only the women asked to kind of quote unquote dress up and give flowers to the honored guests? Uh, language changes. 
for example, use men and women instead of male and female because that encapsulates the idea that gender is a social construct rather than uh, focusing on the biology. Uh, so gender, I, I mean, uh, this institution has a very strong humanities department. I think I don't need to explain what is meant by a social construct. Uh, but I, I mean, we feel that men, women uh, encapsulates that idea better than just saying male and female. Uh, don't require uh, to know the marital status of uh, members of staff. Uh, I did check the IIT Guwahati website and I didn't find this anywhere, so that's a nice thing. Uh, but there are many institutions even to this day which will tag their members by their marital status if they are women. Uh, and then, of course, uh, have this sort of uh, language thing, which is a small thing. People often dismiss it, but that's so small. Why are you making a big deal out of it? But I think it does influence how we think. Uh, so use personnel instead of manpower, humankind instead of mankind, etc. Uh, another uh, uh, sort of a thought is that for the gender box, which is usually uh, used in, for instance, conference registrations and so on, rather than just have a bland box saying gender, uh, if we have a box saying what gender do you identify with? and have multiple options such as these, which is perhaps a step, it's not necessarily perfect, but perhaps it's a step towards being welcoming of all genders. So equality education, uh, we feel, is particularly important for the gatekeepers, namely institution leaders, deans, directors, journal editors, uh, telescope time allocation committee is there because uh, I'm an astrophysicist and uh, that, that's another very uh, common arena for discrimination. Conference uh, SOC chairs and funding uh, agency directors. So everyone needs to also learn about inappropriate behavior and some of these cartoons uh, sort of illustrate that. You can perhaps uh, not read the text. So uh, the cartoon on the left was published in a magazine called Resonance, which is a science magazine for under, undergraduate level uh, people, uh, where it says uh, there is a report which says there is a paucity of women in leadership roles, which is at the bottom. And then the person um, near the board says, type B should not talk so much in meetings and express opinions. It makes them difficult to get along with. Uh, the second uh, cartoon s has this man saying, excuse me, uh, ladies, could you tell me where the selection committee members are? Uh, and of course, the women say, here we are. Uh, and the last one, I'm sure you've seen it many times. Uh, the chair of the meeting is saying, that's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the women would like to make it. And this is an experience that uh, several of us uh, who are women uh, in science have encountered many, many times. Uh, each of the each time it seems like a small thing and to be dismissed, but then it becomes part of the climate. Uh, equality education is particularly important for mentors. Uh, this, I think, uh, is not emphasized enough. I mean, the number of people who have told me, a uh, number of women who have told me that as young people, they were told that either science is not for them or physics is not for them or uh, they should take some easier uh, course. I even heard a recent thing, you know, computational astrophysics is uh, uh, has been a modern development in the last few decades with the advancement in computation. And I've even heard uh, young women being giving advice that why don't you do computational astrophysics? You can, you know, you can run your program, and it'll take a couple of hours to run. So then you can go and do all your home care uh, jobs. Uh, so uh, it is really, really, I think, important that mentors, which is us, which is you know professors, and uh, that we undergo uh, education so that we don't give biased, uh, quote unquote, advice to young people. Uh, I want to uh, uh, point out that uh, this is Andrea Gez, who is an astrophysicist in um, UCLA, and uh, she discovered a giant black hole in the center of our Milky Way uh, through very persistent uh, observations uh, in Hawaii on uh, a mountaintop. 
uh, over many uh, decades and she won the Nobel Prize in 2020 along with two others for physics and she was the fourth woman only to uh, get the Nobel Prize in physics and uh, she has talked about her own experience uh, growing she up. She said, I grew up hearing the word no all the time. You're a girl, you can't do it. You're a girl, there is no way you can get into MIT. Uh, there is no way you can get into Caltech. Uh, I have actually heard colleagues, my own colleagues, tell uh, young, uh, you know, they'll tell young men, yeah, that's if you stick with your passion, you know, go for it, and etc. And to the young women, they will say, but you need to very work very hard, you know, you need to manage your uh, family and your uh, science. And I've never heard anybody tell a young man that they need to work hard and manage their family and their science. So I think we really, really need to change that. And that will only happen if senior academics uh, undergo uh, equality education. So um, I just want to end with saying, uh, if you would uh, like to endorse the Hyderabad Charter, uh, do go through it and write me an email. Thank you.